weather forecast. I'm sure that conjures up some images or some stories in your mind. And I'm going to bet that those stories about a forecast that went bad and wrecked some activity that you had planned. And while I don't deny that we have problems with our weather forecasts, and we have challenges like uh, forecasting seasonal forecast, hurricane intensity, tornado touchdowns, by any systematic measurement, weather forecasts are getting better. In the 1960s, which is only 50 years ago, it was unthinkable that we could routinely make accurate two-day forecasts. And we do that routinely now for four-day, five-day forecasts. So forecasts are getting better. And at lunchtime, we can talk about why that's the case. But what I want to focus on today is not how it's improving, but talk about how we as individuals engage in the forecasting process and how that has changed with time. And specifically, how technologies how have changed that engagement. Now, when I talk about engaging in a weather forecasting process, I'm talking about four steps. That first step is as an observer. You can be an observer of the weather. You have to make observations of the weather before you can make a forecast. The second way to engage is as a forecaster. You can take those observations and any tools that you may have and your expertise and your experience and make a weather forecast. That could be 10 minutes from now, or that could be three, four days from now. The fourth way of engaging is as a consumer. You use that forecast. It may be your forecast or it may be somebody else's forecast. But you use that forecast to make a decision about something that you're going to do. And then the fourth and final way of engaging is something I am certain you are all involved in, and that is as an evaluator or as a critic. <laughs> right? If something goes wrong, you're going to complain to somebody. So let's take a look at how our engagement as individuals, as laypersons, and as professionals has changed with time. And I want to begin with our ancestors. And by ancestors, I mean the time before we had instrumentations. Our ancestors heavily relied on weather and weather forecasting, just like we do today. They needed to know when to plant, when to harvest, when to seek shelter. And with regard to these four methods of engaging, they were actively engaged in all four of them. While they didn't have instruments, they made careful observations of the environment around them and how that was changing. And they used those observations and how things would change in order to come up with rules of thumb that did forecasts. And as they came up with those rules of thumbs, they were continually evaluating and adjusting as they made decisions about that. Rules of thumb, an example of that, is a folklore forecast, such as red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. That's a saying that's built on careful observations of the environment and as underlying scientific principles. Red sky at night, sailors delight. That's a recognition that at our latitude where we live, weather systems move from west to east. Red sky at night means that to the east, where the sun, to the west, sorry, where the sun is setting, it's clear skies. And that's the delightful weather that's heading our way. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning, indicates that to the east, far to the east, where the sun is rising, it must be clear so that sunlight can give us the red skies above. Which means to the west, there's a cloud system that's heading our way, and we should be careful of that. So our ancestors were engaged actively in all four aspects. First technology that's going to begin to change our engagement is instruments. Thermometers, barometers, hygrometers, wind vanes. The great thing about instruments is that they give us consistent observations of the parameter that they're measuring. The disadvantage, though, is that if you do not have that instrument, you cannot engage in that aspect of the weather forecast. But if you do have that instrument and your colleague has that instrument, you can make consistent measurements and you can compare them. And that's exactly what Ben Franklin did. He made very careful observations in Philadelphia. And he noticed from his observations that under certain weather conditions, if he experienced those conditions, that the next day his brother in Boston would get those similar weather conditions. And so when he saw them, he could communicate to his brother that he could expect these types of weather conditions. And I'm sure if it didn't happen, his brother criticized them, right? Because <laughs> that's what happened. 
As time went on, more and more people got those instrumentations and they could make those observations and they realized if we take them all at the same time and put them on a map, we have a snapshot of what the weather looks like across the continent. And if we do that every hour, we can monitor how the weather's changing. But there's a lot of weather variables to plot, right? There's temperature, there's pressure, there's pressure change, there's humidity, there's cloud cover, there's cloud type, there's wind speed, wind direction, wind intensity, precipitation, precipitation type, etc. You need a code to put all that information on a map. And we have that code. But if you don't have the key to decode it, it further move, removes you from the observation part of the weather forecasting process. But if you can do that code, and this is what scientists do, they began to look at this data. And they realized, of course, that weather is complex. It's not simple. And in order to do forecast, they needed to take that complexity and simplify it. They needed to simplify it into conceptual models. What do I mean by conceptual model? A conceptual model is a simple construct that represents the heart of a complex entity. And what I'd like to do is to have you help me explain that. And what I want you to do to demonstrate it is I want you to take out your magic pen and your magic piece of paper and draw a human face. And if you're lefty, you can do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go, draw. I want you to draw a human face. You only have 10 seconds. I have limited time. So get going. Get drawing. Draw a human face. You done? Okay. I'm going to bet that many of you drew something like this. Right? You show that picture to somebody and say, what is that? They're going to say, that's a face. That's a human face. It's not a cat face. That's a human face. Right? I don't know anybody who looks like that. <laughs> Right? If I saw somebody like that coming down the street, I'd probably be a little afraid. <laughs> right? Because this is not a human face. Right? It's a conceptual model of a human face. If you're going to describe somebody to somebody else, you're going to use this model. You're going to talk about the eyes, what their color is, what their shape is. The eyebrows, are they thin, are they thick? What about the nose? Is it long, pointy, crooked, broken? The mouth, big, small, thin lips, thick lips. The ears, they flat back, or are they sticking out? What about the hair? <laughs> right? Long and flowing, perhaps? <laughs> weather is like the human face. No two weather systems are exactly alike, and they're complex. And so with the observations, the weather scientists began to put together conceptual models about the, how the weather worked. And one of those conceptual models was the Norwegian model of the mid-latitude cyclone, our winter storms. And this is just a simple construct a conceptual model of how winter storms move across North America. The key again, this is used not only to understand how systems move, but then in the forecasting process. If you don't understand this conceptual model, it removes you from the forecasting process. The scientists who were developing this conceptual model soon realized that, hey, the atmosphere is a fluid. It moves like a fluid, and therefore there must be mathematical equations that can use to describe that motion, and therefore can be used to do the forecasting. And indeed, that started in World War I by this fellow right here, L.F. Richardson. He was a scientist. He was also a Quaker and a conscientious objector. And so what he did during World War I was drive an ambulance. And in between doing the service as an ambulance driver, he decided to do science. He decided to do the first numerical weather prediction forecast. Now, before we talk about what he did and how he did it, I want to demonstrate a little bit more about what a numerical prediction is. And I'm going to do that by using this ball. If I take this ball and I drop it, there are equations to describe its movement, the kinematic equations of motion. And you can predict, using those equations, how long it's going to take for that ball to hit the ground. This is a simple homework problem in any introductory physics course. And if you want to get more complicated, you can predict not only how long is it going to take to hit the ground, but after it hits the ground, how high it's going to bounce. And if you want to get more complicated, you can drop two balls. The more complex you get, the more computations it requires. And that's what numerical prediction is. Now, before we move on, let's take this opportunity to have you help me describe what an experiential forecast is. Right? You've all had balls. You've all had experiences playing with balls. You all have expertise 
And in your mind, you have conceptual models of how balls bounce. So I want you to predict how high this ball is going to bounce when I let it go. When I drop it, it'll fall, it'll hit the ground. Don't talk to your neighbor. <laughs> I want you to predict how high it's going to drop, how high it's going to bounce. It's going to bounce this high. How about this high? This high. This high. This high. OK, so most of you are predicting it's going to bounce right about this high. Let's run the experiment and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> terrible forecast. I can be the critic here. Right? You got it all wrong. Terrible bust. Why? You had the initial conditions wrong. Right? And that's the key about numerical prediction, whether it's bouncing balls or weather forecasts. You need to get the initial conditions right. If you don't have them right, your forecast will be a bust. So how did L.F. Richardson do? He picked May 20th, 1910 to do his forecast because he had good observations across Europe uh, to make that observations. His forecast, terrible. Just like your bouncing ball forecast. Because, not because he had calculations wrong on his slide ruler, but because he had a bad data point. So his initial conditions were wrong. His forecast was totally unrealistic. Didn't stop him, though. After his entire career after that was about promoting numerical weather prediction forecasting, and he wrote a book about it. But come World War I, are we doing numerical weather predictions? He envisioned we'd have 60,000 people with slide rulers forecasting the weather for tomorrow. That's not what was done in World War II. You still had careful observations, we had conceptual models, and we had experts using those observations, their expertise, and their conceptual models to doing the forecast. And in some situations, in some battles, those forecasts were critical. The generals were the consumers, the, the experts were doing the forecasting. But what did come out of World War II were technologies that would not only change our capability to do forecasting, but also would change our engagement in the forecasting process. One of those technologies is, of course, the computers. The computers, to do forecasting, they can do it much more accurately, much faster than humans. We didn't need 60,000 people with slide rulers. And as computers got bigger and better and faster, our numerical weather prediction gets, big, gets better as well, because we can represent more physical processes in those equations of motions. So computers were key. But again, if you don't have a computer, you can't engage in the forecasting process. Another advantage that came out, or a technology that came out, was the weather radar. Radars were used to detect airplanes. And when weather was in between you and the plane, you had clutter. And that wasn't good. At the end of World War II, there were a lot of surplus radars, and a lot of scientists were buying those up and using them to study the weather. Just to show you how young our field is, this is a radar image from 1982 used by the National Weather Service in their forecasting offices. That's a far cry from what we see today, where radars are used to routinely monitor where precipitation is, where it's going, what its intensity is, and what type of precipitation it is, rain, snow, or hail. Another technology that came out shortly after World War II was things associated with the space race, right? Getting things into space, not just to the moon, but getting them into space to study space and communication process. And this began with the Russian launch of a satellite known as Sputnik. Sputnik. That's right. That was the first one. And the US jumped right into that. And scientists here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison realized that if we're going to put satellites, or moonlets, as they were called back then, into space, let's put instruments on them and look back at Earth and study Earth. And so they developed an instrument to look back at Earth and measure the heat balance of the Earth. Not so much important for weather forecasting, but critical for understanding climate. So they did that. And in June of 1959, they launched their satellite, and it blew up. <laughs> <laughs> so not to be deterred, they built another one and launched that a month later, in July 1959. And that blew up. <laughs> There were a lot of failures, launch failures, in the early days of the US space program. So many so that people jokingly called it the Kaputnik program, or the, <laughs> the Flopnik, or the Stay Putnik. <laughs> but eventually they succeeded. And in October of that year, they launched the satellite, and that's the actual satellite, uh, where they put their instrument on to measure the energy budget of Earth. And it was the first useful and successful mission. 
Vernsumi went on to make a lot of other inventions associated with weather satellites, the cloud imaging that is currently on weather satellites, geostationary satellites that we see today, uh, as well as computer methods to analyze that data. So many so that he is known now as the father of satellite meteorology. And Wisconsin is known as the birthplace of weather satellites. In fact, he has a, he has a satellite named after him, the Sumi NPP. Satellites are critical to the weather forecasting process. Remember our bouncing ball? You needed to know the initial conditions. Well, if you need to do a weather forecast for two or three days from now, you need to know where the weather is everywhere all over the globe. And the only way you're going to get that is from satellite observations. In fact, when we do a numerical weather prediction, the initialization of that model, the observations that go into that, 99% of that data is coming from satellites. Our US satellites as well as international satellites. And without the satellites, our weather forecast would be a lot worse. So what are we seeing? We're seeing since World War II that technologies are not only making the weather forecast process better, but it's also shifting us into playing the role of consumer of the expert forecast and, of course, the critic. Right? We're disengaged from the observer and the forecast method. In fact, the observations are all being done automatically right now, and they automatically feed into a computer, and the computer automatically makes a computer forecast. So the technologies are disengaging us. What about the future or current? I'm arguing that things are beginning to change. And why are they beginning to change? They're beginning to change because of these things, right? I'll bet that most of you out in the audience have one of these. And these now come with weather apps, standard. And I'm going to bet that most of you out there have an app that looks at the radar data. And if you're indoors and you need to go outside and you think it's going to rain or it is raining, you're going to fire up your radar app and you're going to watch that animation and you're going to predict when it's either going to start raining or stop raining. So this is giving you the information to be a forecaster, albeit a small time, but you're doing it. In addition, there are apps on here that allow you to make observations. When the Sumi NPP satellite flies by, my phone rings and tells me to go outside and make a cloud observation <laughs> so that I can correlate that cloud observation from the ground with the satellite imagery. So it's moving us back into engaging in the forecasting process as well as into the observing process. Now, I'm a weather forecaster. I'm a weather guy. So let's imagine. Right? Let's forecast into the future, 50 years from now. These technologies, you know, they're a decade old. Satellites are only 50 years old. Let's imagine 50 years from now, where are we going to be in terms of our engagement? Well, I'm going to argue that we have tiny instruments now that do weather observations. So let's take those thermometers, those barometers, those hygrometers, make them into buttons and wear them. We have windshield wipers now that detect how hard it's raining out and then adjust their speed based on that detection. Let's take that technology and put it on an umbrella or on a hat or on our clothes. We'll be wearing weather instruments. We need to power them, but we're already making cloth that is photovoltaic material. So we'll be wearing the batteries as well. In addition to the advancements in satellites and radars and car technologies that are coming along, we'll be flying drones around as well. And they'll be making consistent observations of the wind as well. All that data is going to be going out wireless someplace, and you'll have access to it from your personal device, whatever that is. Your phone will now have the computing capabilities of today's supercomputers. So what you'll be able to do is to ask that phone for a forecast for a particular place at a particular time so that you can do a particular activity. And it'll give you that forecast. And you'll use your experience and your expertise to interpret that forecast and to take an action. And if you take the wrong action, you'll blame somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm engaging on and stating is that in 50 years from now, new technologies are going to engage us just like our ancestors were in the full process of the forecast. You'll be the observer. You'll be the forecaster. You'll be the user of that forecast. And of course, you'll be the critic. Thank you.